Hi, I'm Gary and this is episode 189 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at getting the best out of your EV range-wise. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap the free download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to ask a favor. I spent a lot of time out at events and meeting people, and uh, the people I speak to tell me, oh, I've heard of your podcast, but I haven't listened to it, which can be a bit demoralizing. But nevertheless, I'd like to enlist you listeners to help spread the good word. If you could go into Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show, give us a review and a rating. The more that do that, the more that the algorithm will surface the show to other people looking for similar content. Thank you. Now, our main topic of discussion today is EV efficiency. Every EV advertised will tell you what its range is. There'll be fantastic numbers like 310 miles WLTP and 600 kilometers. WLTP. These all sound really good and exciting until you remember those four letters at the end, WLTP. Sam Clark from GridServe, who will come up again later in the show, says that that stands for way less than planned. But in reality, it stands for Worldwide Harmonized Light Vehicle Testing Procedure, which just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? In effect, it's a set of testing standards that can be applied to all vehicles to determine, amongst other things, how far a vehicle can travel on a given unit of energy. For electric cars, this is a kilowatt hour. For an internal combustion engine car, it's a litre of fossil fuel. Using standardised settings and conditions, all vehicles are evaluated and a figure is produced. For electric cars, this then translates into a range value. Now, the only problem with WLTP figures is that they're all rubbish. Not rubbish in a bad way, I mean... We all need a standardised value against which to evaluate things. But rubbish in a way that they don't bear any relationship to real-life driving. For example, my ID3 has a WLTP range of 265 miles. The day it arrived at my house on the back of a flatbed last year, it had 98% state of charge with 224 miles on the gob. In day-to-day driving over winter, it can just break 200 miles of range, and in warm weather, it goes back up to 220 miles. In reality, nobody manages to match the WLTP range because nobody drives under the strict conditions of the WLTP testing regimen. Or do they? To talk about this, I'm delighted to welcome Guinness World Record holder Kevin Booker to the show. Kevin holds the Guinness World Record for lowest energy consumption driving. He drove the length of the country, with just one stop to recharge in a Mustang Mach-E. Uh, welcome to the show, Kevin. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, now, I, I want to talk about driving efficiently and how listeners can do that, but I can't start the show without asking you about the world record John O'Groats to Land's End run. Or was it the other way around? Was it Land's End to John O'Groats or John O'Groats to Land's um, End? So it's John O'Groats to Land's End. Um, a lot of people joke saying, well, you did it the easy way because it's all downhill because <laughs> you started at the top. But uh, basically, yeah, it's the same gradient either way. Interesting. Tell me um, tell me about that. So you did it in the Marquee. What, what spec did you use on that? So with the Marquee, we used the uh, extended range version, but the rear-wheel drive one. So the one with just rear-wheel drive, but the biggest battery available. Okay. And as with every time somebody mentions a, an EV, someone's got to say, well, what sort of range are you getting on that then? Um, well, with that, we were getting, uh, on the record attempt, we had over 500 miles capability between, between charges. That's phenomenal. What's the, what's the actual advertised range on that particular uh, battery pack, do you know? Um, I believe at the time it was 370. It's gone up slightly now because Ford have unlocked more of the usable battery capacity. When we did it originally, it was 90 kilowatt hours of usable capacity. And now I believe it's 92 on that particular model because it did have a massive safety buffer of over 10 kilowatt hours. That is a bit of a safety buffer, isn't it? 
What efficiency did you actually end up getting at the end of the day on that? So just over 6.5 miles per kilowatt hour. And we'll go on and talk a little bit about how you got that. But in terms of your general everyday driving, is that extraordinary for you or is that about average for you? Um, it can depend on the car because, you know, the car is the biggest kind of deciding factor of that. If you've got a really poorly designed car for efficiency, no matter how carefully you drive, you're not going to get magic efficiency numbers out of it. So, I mean, I've got, an Ionic 5 at the moment, and I'm averaging today about 4.7 miles per kilowatt hour, and that's not really trying, that's just driving it fairly normally. Now, I think I believe when I talked to you about this earlier, there were certain things you did to try and keep the weight of the actual marquee down. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, basically, with that, uh, it was more just taking out anything, so we didn't have the, the manufacturer's mats in it. Um, we didn't have the spare tire in it, so but it wasn't major things we did. It, as the Guinness rules stipulate, it has to be for the record. You have to be able to do it in a production car, so so that any person could go out and try and break that record. So it can't have shut lines taped shut. It has to be pretty much a production car. The only thing you can do is we put A-rated tires on it, and that's allowed because anyone else could go out and buy an A-rated tire for that vehicle. And I. I think we ought to point out for people, you actually had support vehicles with you following you all the way, didn't you? Uh, yeah, for that, because um, the Guinness rules are quite strict. We had to have professional witnesses, so that's why we had the AA as a support vehicle, but they were also our independent witnesses, so they witnessed that there was no kind of skullduggery going on in the event, that we didn't cheat, we didn't charge it. So they were there as independent witnesses to follow us the whole time. And what was your actual driving time um, on the full journey? Um, with the driving time, it's a bit of a difficult one to determine because we were doing it with sort of, we had a BBC camera person with us. We had the AA. Our driving time was more dictated, not by the speed we could go, but by the health and safety regs of how often we had to stop to comply with the AA's health and safety policy. So we had to stop for 15 minutes every two hours. A minimum. So we try to time that with driver swaps, but it's sort of the timings with that. So it, it wasn't a quick record. It took us less than 24 hours to do the whole thing, but a lot of the stops were to do with health and safety and driver changes. Ah, that's interesting because, and I'll come back to that in a little bit when we, when we talk about, well, <laughs> let's move on to it now. Well, I want to talk about the, the actual methods that you use to get such efficiency on that. And you use a technique called hypermiling, I believe. That's now, right, yeah. Um, a lot of the people who listen to my podcast will be aware of that. But for those that aren't, do you want to just give them a quick um, sort of preview of what hypermiling means? So hypermiling is basically trying to get the most range out of an a electric or fuel vehicle by driving in the most efficient way possible. So it's things like gentle acceleration, knowing sort of the point where the car's at its sweet spot of rolling resistance versus wind resistance that the biggest factor on a car is aerodynamic drag so once you get past a certain speed the energy required to push you for the air it's not a linear curve it's quite a steep curve so the difference between say 60 and 70 is much greater than the difference between 30 and 60 ah. for example uh, now it's interesting because because i came down from my parents over the weekend and i did a 137 mile stint at 60 miles an hour on the motorway, which according to the car, because of various uh, traffic and things like that, averaged 50 miles an hour over the, the whole journey. And I ended up getting five miles a kilowatt hour from my ID3. So I was, I was quite pleased with that. Now, I, I believe you're, the, the phrase you're looking for, or the phrase that people use is it's, um, is it the inverse square law? So as, uh, as you increase the speed, the amount of energy you need to push it through sort of goes up by the uh, the square of the speed or something like that. Is that? Uh... Uh, yeah, it's something like that. I know there's a technical <laughs> term for it. We know it's not a linear curve. I mean, we just, I mean, it's kind of when you hike the mile, you don't go into the detail of the maths on it. You kind of get a feel for it once you've been doing it for quite a few years, because I used to drive efficiently in fueled cars as well. So that's how I actually met the people I did the record with was actually on, there was a, a 
event run by a magazine called Fleet World called the MPG Marathon. And I ended up competing against a lot of them in this event. So then we decided to team up with an EV and actually work together to actually achieve a record rather than being against each other as we have in the past. Okay. So, well, when you were doing your trip in the marquee, when you were on a motorway, were you staying 60? Were you doing 55? How, how did that work? So you were sitting around about the sort of the speed that a, a truck would do rather than going sort of, so you were staying, not slipstreaming the trucks, but staying at the sort of speed a truck would do down the motorway. So think of it as about a 56-ish, between 50, 56, depending on what the speed limiters are. So rather than racing past them all, you were just staying with them. I mean, if you had a particularly slow one, because obviously when you're hypermiling, you want to try and use the contours of the land to help you as well. So you might drop off a bit of speed going up a hill, but you might allow it to gain a bit going down. So you need to kind of, it's almost getting that balance of maximizing the road conditions as well and using that to help you get the efficiency as well. So there's a lot of thought of reading the road ahead. So you can see when you're going to reach the brow of a hill to let it taper off the speed a bit to then know that you're going to regain it going down that hill. And were you running, particularly with the marquee, were you running with the display up that was telling you your average efficiency and your sort of spot efficiency at that time? Was that information always displayed for you in the vehicle? Um, What we found was actually the onboard systems had a lot of rounding in them. So they actually fudged the figures quite a lot. So what we had was because we had to log all the data for Guinness, we use a company called Intrepid, which do data loggers, and they work with a lot of manufacturers at the prototyping phase. They're sort of, they're not like your standard data loggers you'd have from the companies that, you know, monitor fleets and things like that. They actually work with companies at the prototyping stage. So we had something called their Vivican controller, which actually is a screen that they can program, which can give you real time information from the car's diagnostic systems. So we actually had real data without the fudging on it. So we knew exactly how many kilowatts were going into the motor and knew exactly how much regen was coming back. So we had that really detailed display on the, which was, it was a byproduct of actually needing to log the data for Guinness. But it worked out very handy because you could see exactly what the car was doing. Wonderful. Because looping back to what you said earlier on, uh, talk to us a little bit about the physics. Be it, no, well, well, yes, but which, which parts of a journey generally use more energy? Because I have it in my mind that if you're taking a, you know, a two-ton car like a Marquis and accelerate it, accelerating it from standstill up to, you know, truck driving speed on a motorway, you're going to be using more energy than just keeping that vehicle at truck driving speed. And yet you said that because of the uh, AA standards, you had to stop every 15 minutes. So was that stop, sorry, stop for 15 minutes every? 15 minutes every two hours, roughly. Every two hours. So every time you you did that stop, were you kind of thinking, uh, I'm now going to have to use a lot more energy to to get going again, or is that me just not understanding how this works? I think it's just because of the sheer distances involved, it wasn't a huge issue. I mean, if you could have driven continuously, we might have got a couple of points more miles per kilowatt hour there, but actually over a long distance, because two hours is still, you know, a good, probably getting a good 70 to 100 miles under your, your belt, depending on traffic. And actually, you on a road trip like that, you can kind of cancel that out. The worst bit would be city driving. And the advantage with an EV is as long as you get a feel for when you're using regen braking rather than normal braking, you're not losing quite as much as you would in a fueled car. Do you get roughly on regen, roughly about 70% of the energy back that you use to go up a hill or accelerate? So it's not as catastrophic a loss as it would be in a traditional fueled car. Ah, uh, okay. I haven't done the maths, but I'm not, I'm on the fence a little bit when it comes to regen. So with regen, does the regen you get from braking not replace the extra power lost by driving in a high regen mode? Because one of the things I think that you like to do is to cut regen down to the lowest level you can. Am I right in that? Yeah. So basically we put regen to the lowest level because the regen systems are 
they're not necessarily intelligent because they don't see the road ahead like you do. So what you've got to learn is the point on the brake pedal, which is quite difficult in some cars, is when you're, you switch from regen braking to friction braking, and you need to do the process the car does in high regen mode, basically with your foot pedal. So you've got to be so gentle on the brakes to make sure that you're not triggering the car to think it's an emergency situation where it puts on the real friction brakes. So that's the, the difficult part is knowing that point. I mean, that's the one criticism I probably would give of the Mackey. There is quite an obvious transition between regen braking and friction braking. You can feel a definite pulse. I don't know if they've tweaked the software now, but you could feel a definite pulse from when it switched from regen to physical brakes. So uh, one of the things, I, I say, I drive the ID3 and it's got the little lever on the, uh, on the gear. You can go from low regen to high regen. So one of the things that I was doing was I would drive in, in you know, the lowest level of regen possible, as you just said. And then if I saw the traffic coming to a halt ahead of me, I would come off the accelerator. So we're then freewheeling, more or less, and then I'd switch it into high regen. So it would then put the brakes on, the, the regen, and put that back into the power. Is that, are you saying that's not necessarily the best way of doing it? I mean, that's, that's one, a valid reason or way to do it but you can do all of those things with the brake pedal as well. It just means you have to be a lot more gentle and know the car quite well. So re high regen, because I've got an Ionic 5 where you can vary it, I will now vary it going down a hill to maintain my speed and let the car do the work. Um, the other thing as well, in a lot of modern cars, I've found Hyundai quite good at this, is they've got very gentle acceleration curves on their adaptive crews. So you can actually be quite efficient in the Ionic 5 on a motorway, just letting it do all the work for you. Um, in the Mustang Marquee, we used what's called Whisper Mode, which actually has, has the lowest regen settings. But you've also got now, which might help, is they've now launched Blue Cruise, which wasn't available when we had that. And Blue Cruise is apparently quite efficient as well. Interesting to know. Talk to me a little bit more about adaptive cruise control and how you use it, because uh, I believe I've heard you say at some point that the one thing you do first is you stick everything into the most efficient drive mode, which, you know, generally it's eco. Um, and then do you use ACC as much as possible or do you just like, I, I mean, I use it pretty much full-time driving, I'll, you know, to keep to 30 mile an hour, et cetera. Do you switch it on and off as needed or what? So when, I, when I'm driving my own car, not in a Guinness World Record mode, I'll generally use automatic the automatic cruise control all the time because it basically if you use the automatic cruise control it's more efficient for most general driving but when you're on instead of guinness world record mode you tend not to do that because it will power up a hill and it'll resist too much coming down a hill whereas in a record mode you want to maximize on a motorway for example say you're doing 50 and the, the just the contour of the road will allow you to go up to 65 70 You'll take that free speed going down a hill, but when you're going up a hill, you don't want to power up it. You want to let it taper off as gradually as possible. So you're kind of almost giving the same power input to the motor, but not actually holding speed. You're letting it slowly drift down. So with that, you can't really do that with cruise control. So it's, it's kind of all manual, hands-on type driving for that. But generally, when you're driving normally, I can easily get mid fives out of my uh, Ionic 5 with the adaptive cruise control. The car that was the most efficient at that is probably the second generation Hyundai Ionic. The one that's got the nickname, the wind knife, because it just literally cuts through the air and is stupidly efficient. Come on, t tell me what's the best you've got out of, out of the wind knife then. So when I had one of those, my best was 7.2. The problem being with it is it's, it couldn't, we did look at that as a potential for the record, but it's crippled by slow charging speeds and not a very big range. So you couldn't do, you could probably get the efficiency record if you were patient enough, because we worked out in the Ionic with the charging speed, it probably would have taken us about two days because you're limited for those charge stops. So the, the Mustang Marquee had the, the right compromises to get all three records. So there's, there's individual cars that might be able to beat it on efficiency, although 
you'd have to have a lot of patience in an Ionic to maintain 6.5 for that many miles after knowing you've got to stop every couple of hours for pretty much a 50 to 60 minute charge to get it up to a reasonable level. Ah, interesting. Because of course with, with charging, there are two uh, sort of schools of thought. One is you put in as much as you can and go for as long as possible and have a long charge. The other one is you charge enough to get you to the next charge stop. So, you know, you might only be doing 60% um, on the understanding that it's a quicker charge stop, but you'd be making more of them. So presumably a, a calculation like that would have uh, been made when you were prepping for the, uh, for the record. Uh, yeah, because the, the Mustang, we actually did, uh, when we charged at the uh, one and only charge stop, we charged to, uh, I think it was 81% and then carried on. So, <laughs> so one charge stop and you only went up to 81% rather than up to 100%. Yeah, because that's, wow. cause you had the, the issue with the uh, Mach-E at the time was its charge curve. So it would charge really quick. So it would hold over 100 kilowatts up to 80%. And then eighty percent, it dropped to twelve. So basically, eighty percent was our limit because we didn't want to stop. That's why eighty-one was just a discrepancy because of batteries getting warm. Because we stopped at basically eighty, and as it sorted itself out when you ignitioned on, it said eighty-one. So literally, we couldn't go higher than eighty percent because we'd lose the charging time. One, so we were committed then at the. Uh, so from Wigan, we were committed to get to Land's End. And what did you arrive with? What percentage? We arrived with, um, it had stopped saying miles. It was saying on the dashboard, battery depleted, stop safely now. But we could see from the direct connection to the diagnostic system, we had about three kilowatts hours left of usable. So it was fairly tight. That was about one or two percent, I think. Was there ever a little voice on your shoulder going, we're not going to make it? Um, the worst bit was when the guessometer started showing less than the range we had left. Um, it was actually over Bodmin, because over Bodmin, the worst thing happened that can possibly happen when you're trying to hyper mile, really heavy rain with lots of surface water. Because the biggest thing for a sapping efficiency is not necessarily just cold, it's lots of surface water because all that extra energy your tires have to use to get rid of the water from the tread to keep you having grip. Which is? So that was the diciest bit. I could understand that because I think what you're talking about there is one aspect of rolling resistance, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And Bodmin as well is quite hilly. Mm -hmm. So every hill you're seeing the gasometer get further and further away from how far you've got left to go. Oh, that's, um, that's a bit worrying when that happens, isn't it? Yeah. So it, I mean, it did it, but it was like, I think my nail marks are still in the seat belt of that car. Talk to me a little bit more about rolling resistance, because one of the ways that you can reduce that is by having a different tire type, different tire compound or different tire pressures. Uh, how does that play into it? So with the tire pressures, we had a, a full car because we had some camera equipment and all the drivers. So we set it to the maximum you're allowed. So, you know, you've got the two settings on a car that show you if it's fully loaded or if it's half. So we had it on the fully loaded tire pressures because effectively the car did have three, three adults in it, big camera from the BBC and all the equipment in the boot. So even if we'd wanted to carry the spare tire, I don't think we could have done because it wouldn't have been enough space. So there's that. And we just made sure that we spec. This is where a lot of people make mistakes with tires, especially on EVs is a cheap tire is not necessarily the best tire for it. You know, you re really need to be conscious of the energy rating. So the rolling resistance rating had been an A because in a full charge in a modern EV, that A rated tire could give you 20, 30 miles more range than if you put a budget tire on, which is say an E or a D. And that's all as a result of the, what the profile of the tire, the tread of the tire or the compound? Um, it's a mixture of compound tread design. There's a lot of science that goes into uh, the tire manufacturer. So it's, I mean, a lot of them are closely guarded secrets on how they get that efficiency, but it's a combination of compound and tread pattern mainly anyway. And how much difference does the weight either of the car or in the car make when it comes to efficiency? I mean, 
it makes a difference. Obviously, we probably could have got more efficiency if you'd done it with one driver, but I know the health and safety from the BBC would never have let us do it with one driver for that length of time. So, I mean, weight uh, can be a big factor, but the biggest weight is the battery pack, which you can't really change massively until we have sort of more modern solid state batteries, which reduce the weight massively, or some of the new lithium ion ones that are quoting, is it 500 uh, watt hours per kilogram or something like that, isn't it? I think the new ones I saw announced around about fully charged time. So it's, I mean, that's, so that's your biggest factor because you think the battery probably weighs as much as a full car of passengers. So that would be where the biggest saving comes. So some stuff is just purely, you know, like the cycling teams use tiny incremental gains. So you gain a little bit from the tires, you gain a little bit from not carrying a spare wheel, but you find most EVs now only have a flat fixed kit anyway. Yes. Yeah. So mine's exactly like that. And of course, the other factor that plays into it is the actual uh, drag coefficient on the vehicle. Uh, you, I mean, you talked about the, the wind knife, the early Ionic, the 28 kilowatt hour and the, was it 38 kilowatt hour? They're really... They're really slim. They've got streamlined shapes. Now, what are your thoughts on some of these big square EVs currently being sold? I mean, there was a fully charged Live North when they unveiled the the Munro Big Yellow, which was a, a brick of a vehicle, looked like it had been designed in Minecraft. Everything was square by all accounts. You're not going to get any great efficiency on something like that. Now, obviously, you don't need efficiency when you're looking at something like that because it's a practical vehicle. Uh, it's it's got a specific use case or a specific set of use cases, but a lot of that is starting to filter down into the everyday vehicles, the Ford F one fifty that uh, is quite popular out in the uh, US, and the Rivian, and even some of the larger BMWs that we've got. Do you look at that and you kind of shake your head and go, "Why are they doing it that way?" I mean, that is the problem that the market now is tending to favour bigger SUV styles, which aren't as efficient. Because actually, if you look, my Ionic 5 is an example. I got the Ionic 5 because I thought it looked quite cool. That's why I changed it from the Ionic when my contract ended on that. But from an efficiency point of view, the shape of the Ionic 5 means it's worse on a motorway on efficiency than it, the old Ionic was. And I can tell it's not the powertrain because if you're doing sort of round town, you can match the efficiency in an Ionic 5 to that of the original Ionic. You know, I've had six miles per kilowatt hour out of my Ionic 5 around town because wind and drag is not as much of a, an issue there. And you've got a little bit more regen for stuff like that. But you, that's the problem is I think manufacturers do need to focus on things like efficiency. Another prime example is they've just launched the Ionic 6 in the, uh, the UK. The UK model only comes with 20-inch alloy wheels. And actually, size of wheels affects efficiency. So if you look at the stats for the Korean version, which is available on 18-inch wheels, it gets an extra 50 miles official range over the one with the 20-inch wheels. And I think manufacturers have almost lost their way on that because people like a big SUV with big alloy wheels. The market is dictating it rather than efficiency. And I think that almost needs to be sort of told to people who are buying EVs that there is a better way. You can have more efficient EVs, but you do have to sacrifice your 20-inch wheels or your big boxy SUV. Very, very valid points. And if I can summarize what we've said over the last few minutes, you need to look at a car that has a streamlined shape. You need to look at a car that's got the, the appropriate size of wheels to get the most efficient. So you need to look at the tire compound um, and ratings to make sure you've got the most efficiency. Uh, maybe look at minimizing the weight as much as you can. But if you get somebody who's got all that and they get into the vehicle, what is it that they need to do once they've got into the vehicle to set it up to drive the most efficiently? Right. But as we've said before, one thing is to make sure it's set to the eco mode because that'll take the edge off the acceleration. I mean, the one thing that people forget is lots of people say how quick EVs are to accelerate. Just because they can accelerate quickly doesn't mean you need to race off flights and everything like you would do in a hot hatch. You can drive it normally like you would have driven your older fueled cars. So it's just more about reading the road ahead. So when you're coming up to sets of traffic lights, it's just 
trying to, like you should be doing in, according to the highway code, is just looking, seeing what's happening ahead to predict that so you can drive in the most gentle way. I, I mean, I, I understand the whole concept of looking ahead, but obviously one of the problems that I always have is I'll be in a, on a road that has, say, four sets of traffic lights that are a quarter of a mile apart. Now, in theory, they should all be set to uh, allow, once they've gone to green, by the time you get to the next one, that should also go to green, and then the next one should also go to green. So you can keep a constant speed and not have to brake. But in reality, we know that that doesn't always happen. So what the, what's the one thing you do when you get yourself in that situation? Do you think, right, I need to just go as slow as possible and try and um, maximize the length of time I can run before I hit the brakes, knowing that it's going to turn to green? Or do you just say, well, I'm going to have to hit the brakes anyway, so it doesn't really matter how slow I'm, or how fast I'm going? I mean, it's with that, it's trying to kind of get that balance between not going too slow and annoying people and just kind of, that's kind of the key to hypermiling is trying to learn that balance. So you're going fast enough not to annoy people, but slow enough not to stop. So, I mean, it's a sort of fine art that you've got to get down to. And you, I mean, if you do regular routes, you start to learn the sequences. But it's when you're somewhere new, that's where you're like, oh, I've missed that traffic lights. And you think I could have been more efficient there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I heard a little rumor, and you, you could tell me whether this is true or not. I heard that your wife's actually even better at this than you are. She can get great figures without even trying. Is that right? Um, that is one of the things is my wife is, that she doesn't drive efficiently normally. She just drives normally. But she has in the past to prove a point, showing, well, I've got this because I can. <laughs> so she can, she's obviously watched the techniques I use and she can employ them when she chooses to. So, I mean, to be fair, she's, she's got a more efficient car than me because she's got a Kona, which will go forever on a charge. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So she's got a slightly better shape car than me, but I know hers is averaging at the moment just with all kind of mixed driving with things like the aircon on, and that's sitting at easily between 4.5, 4.7, sometimes 5. So that's, that's a very easy car to get efficiency out of. It's, uh, even though it is an SUV, it's fairly efficiently designed. It's got some good airflow over it, that sort of thing, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's not massively worse than the original Ionic. I mean, it shares a lot of things. The only thing I wish they do with some of the cars like that is, see, if you have the bigger battery in the Kona, you also have the 200 brake horsepower motor. And for some stuff, because in my day job, I run a fleet of pool vehicles, which are pretty much Konas, and uh, they're all 200 brake horsepower. And for a pool car, sometimes you think, actually, the 137 brake horsepower would be enough, but you do want the bigger battery. So I'm curious to know if it had, the Kona would be even more efficient if you had the bigger battery with the smaller motor. So yes, you've, you've got the bigger battery, which will give you the longer range and the smaller motor, which is pulling less power from the battery at any given point. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing I think manufacturers need to start thinking about is just because you can do a Volvo XC40 all-wheel drive with 400 brake horsepower, you don't necessarily have to. Because when you look back, that's Porsche, 1980s Porsche 911 territory. And you're thinking this is a Volvo XC40, which anyone can get in and out-accelerate supercars from the late 90s or late 80s, sorry. That's ridiculous, isn't it, if you think about it. Is there a question I haven't asked you so far that you were expecting me to ask you? Um, no, I think. Pretty much got them all. Is there anything about efficient driving that we haven't asked you about that you'd like to tell us about? I think the main key things to efficient driving is it's not just one thing. There's a lot of small incremental factors which can make a big difference when they're all combined. So it's combining the right choice of car, the right choice of tyre, the driving style, the maintenance of the car, and you're making sure your tyres are all correctly inflated. And then just that reading the road ahead, it's all kind of a combination of all these things come together to allow you to be more efficient. And I think I would summarize that by saying you don't have to be a Guinness World Record holder to drive efficiently. It can be done by anybody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just because an EV has fast acceleration doesn't mean you have to race off every traffic light. 
but it's so much fun. The problem is, is as you'll know, being an EV driver, there aren't really that many slow EVs. You know, even something like the original Leaf and the original Zoe don't feel slow. They're much quicker than their brake horsepower figures would suggest. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Kevin, you've recently gained another Guinness World Record, this time for driving a van, right? Tell me about that. What were the circumstances? So, basically, I thought, well, we've done the car thing. So, a few of us uh, got together and thought, can we do something in the commercial vehicle space? So, it was my usual co-driver, Fergal, but we actually brought Sam Clark from Gridserve into this one. So, uh, Sam Clark, the man himself. Yeah, yeah, he was the third driver on that. And he actually, to be fair, he can drive really efficiently. So it's actually, but yeah, the van, the idea was to, the Americans had a record for the longest distance to a single charge in an electric van, a vehicle called the Bright Drop, which was 250, 252 miles, I believe. So, uh, but uh, the one thing that kind of let that record down is, um, you'll probably laugh at this when I tell you the size of the battery in the American van. 174 kilowatt hours. <laughs> so, so we thought we could do better in a uh, lowly Fiat e scudo with a 68 kilowatt hour usable battery. And how long did you, did you how far did you get out of the, uh, the 68 kilowatt hour? So, we got uh, 311.4 miles to a single charge. Wow. Giving you an efficiency rating of what? Um, it wasn't massive, but I'm good for a van, 4.5 miles per kilowatt hour. That's, that's good. Full stop. Never mind. Good for a van. You know, I know a lot of people driving quite streamlined electric vehicles, you struggle to get four and a half miles per kilowatt hour, but, uh. Yeah, and the idea was as well, we picked a route that simulated the urban delivery run. So it's, it's to try and show what that van would do in that environment. So it wasn't a quick run, you know, the average was about 30 miles an hour, but it was to simulate what those, the sort of use cases for those vans. And you didn't do this sort of on a whim. It was part of some bigger event, wasn't it, if I'm uh, not mistaken? Um, but it's actually, um, again, because of the, the sort of requiring sponsorship to do kind of Guinness records, because they're not the cheapest things to do. We actually had Webfleet to uh, a telematics partner, so they wanted to show off their telematics thing to show how we can gather data for van drivers and stuff on efficiency and things like that. So they were the sponsor for it. I know we've covered this early on, but did you have Guinness reps sort of there or how was it actually managed and monitored? So we had the AA as the uh, independent adjudicators and for this one to obviously rescue us at the end, because this is one where you know you're going to run out because that's the purpose. But actually, we on the event itself, because we had to make sure the data went up, we had to stop at 2% battery. And that 2% meant we still had some range left. So we thought after we'd done that, just for the fun of it, we'd go back out again to see how far it would actually go. It, it went, so it went 314 miles. And then we ran out totally seven meters from the rapid charger. <laughs> so let me guess, you all got out and pushed, didn't you? Um, well, it, it locked into parks, so we had to then, the AA had a really quiet day, just kind of adjudicating until the end, they had to do loads of stuff to get us the seven meters to the charger, which was fun. So talk, talk to me a little bit again about the route. You said you, you tried to simulate sort of an urban route, but when you say that, did you find one place and keep sort of driving around in circles or, or what? what? What route did you do? So basically for the Guinness rules, it had to be somewhere flat. So we had to do quite an extensive bit of searching of where we could find somewhere that was flat to meet the Guinness guidelines and actually gave us the ability to do the sort of speeds for an urban delivery. So we actually did a hundred mile loop of Peterborough because it's, it's one of the flattest places we could find. We actually, the route we took, there's actually a hundred mile cycle sportive on road route that someone's developed. So we use that. Ah, oh, so taking advantage of the, the two wheel terrain and, uh, and running the vehicle on that instead. Well, it was all roads, but it was a road route. So, but we picked one that because we found someone had already done a flat route. So and it met the Guinness guidelines of being flat enough with not enough gradients because you're not allowed to 
for that. You could cheat. You could say start a really tight high hill, and say we started there and just roll down. <laughs> but it, it, the the interesting thing was um, even on that route, the flat route, just with by gentle driving using regen rather than braking with the web fleet data, we regenerated over eight kilowatt hours. So it shows in an urban setting how EVs are much better because you're getting free energy when you slow down. Uh, now that brings up another question. I was going to ask you about the regen. Now you you said you're in the, the Fiat, uh, presumably, I mean, I'm not sure particularly what that looks like. Is it a, like a, a Luton, a panel van type uh, one, or is it like a transit? So it's uh, basically the the one ton van. So it's the equivalence would be the Toyota Pro Ace, the E Expert, the E Dispatch. So it's, it's it's the Stellantis group of vans. So you could have done it in any of those vans. It was just Fiat got involved in that because they're all the same, and it's the bigger battery version. So the six. It's 74 kilowatt hours, 68 kilowatt hours usable. And presumably you had totally empty in the back, so it was just the the three people yeah, in the front. just the yeah. three of us. And then you realise quite how cramped three seats are in a relatively middle-sized, one-ton capable van. Especially for 311 miles. Um, did you, I mean, presumably you didn't do the 311 in one. Were you? Uh, did you chunk it down into uh, smaller driving stints? So basically, we chunked it down into 300 mile sections. So I did 100 miles, Fergal did 100 miles, and Sam Clark did 100 miles. Um, Sam did the last bit because Sam said he wanted to be the person who actually ran it out. Um, if, if anybody's been listening to the EV Cafe news on a, a Friday, you will hear that uh, Sam takes every opportunity now to mention, um, did, you, did you know I'm a Guinness World Record holder? Um, so the added benefit of being the one who actually got it over the finish line and, and ran it out, that's, um, that's something that I could imagine he'd be very happy to have, uh, on his resume there. So basically you can blame him. He broke it at the end when it ran out. So it was him that sort of killed it off at the end. Uh, to be fair, it was him that was a bad influence at the end when we got to 2%. He said, oh, let's just go out and see what it'll do. We didn't do very far. <laughs> that does sound a lot like Sam, I've got to say. Yeah. Yeah, basically got out to the roundabout and then came back because he's like, oh, this doesn't feel as if it's got much go in it. So what were the the challenges specific to a van that you didn't have in something like a marquee, for example, other than the fact that there's three of you in a, a small place? Main challenges is that, you know, it's a big uplift on WLTP, which we thought. The official WLTP on that van is 205 miles. So, I mean, I I wasn't confident we'd break the 300 mark. I, I was pretty confident we'd break the, the American record, but I didn't think we'd keep going to 300. And what, uh, what sort of average speed were you? Uh... Um, I think that the difficulty was because of the telematics. We, when we did the driver swaps and kind of the quick food breaks, we had to leave it on. So that, was, that logged our average because we were still running when we were doing nothing. But we worked it out at about 30, 30 ish miles an hour. I think the car, I think the vehicle did say 27 on it, but that included the stops for 30 minutes. So basically, urban delivery speed. So lucky there's no flat places in Wales. Otherwise, we may have got even further. Uh, anything else you want to tell us about the, uh, the world record? I mean, it's just that, it's just that the, you know, the challenges of organizing a world record is always difficulty. The number of people you have to have involved, you know, the AA for logistics, the, sponsors that do the telematics and just, you know, coordinating it time. And the other thing on the biggest challenge is the thing you can't control is if it had been a really horrible rainy day, we might not have got that distance. So what was the weather? Was it sort of bright and sunny or was it just nice and overcast or what? It was bright and sunny most of the day, apart from one of the brake stops, it rained during the brake stop and then stopped like five minutes after we'd set off. Because, I mean, the tyres, I mean, the other thing is the tyres were the important choice. So we went for the new Bridgestone, to the Bridgestone van tyres, which are designed to be efficient for electric vans. So there's companies that start to think about those tyres and things like that to make them more efficient in vans. Because they've done that in cars, you know, you have a lot of energy efficient car tyres now, but they're starting to do that for the heavier vehicles now. What's next from a world record point of view? What, uh, what have you got your eyes on now? I don't know. That's a difficult thing, trying to find out one I can, because there are bigger vehicle ones. 
and smaller vehicle ones, but I don't have a license for either of those type of vehicles. So, ah, right. Yes. That, uh, that does cause a problem because I know, um, friend of the podcast, Sarah Sloman's just bought, um, actually her second electric motorbike, which is absolutely, uh, over the moon about, and I could imagine you getting on one of those and doing quite a distance on it. But as you say, yeah, I'll need to pass my bike test for that. But to be fair, Sarah had to do that as well. So, uh, you know, it's not like she already had that. Uh, she went out, made the, uh, made the decision and did it and, uh, hasn't looked back so far. So, uh, you know, you've, you've put that on your bucket list for, uh, for next year, get the license and get it done. I'm sure Sam will, will come up with a few. I think he's got the bug for Guinness world records. Now he's like, he kind of gets it now he's done one. And after, as you say, watching the EV cafe. He, he likes to mention it. I believe it's behind his shoulder a lot of the time, the certificate and all of those. Every single one I've seen since he uh, got the record, it's um, it's there behind him. And he, he, he casually references it either in conversation or by pointing to it uh, on the live stream. So Yeah, I, I think he may, may be uh, letting Paul Kirby know a lot about that one. Kevin, thanks a lot for that. Um, congratulations again on the world record. Is that four or five you've got now? So it's... Uh, that's the fourth one. Well, I say congratulations and uh, thanks a lot for coming in on and chatting about that. Yeah, thanks for having me. A couple of takeaways from this. You don't have to hike a mile to improve your efficiency. Thinking ahead, accelerating slowly, driving with eco mode and low regen will get you some of the way there. Good EV design, the right wheels and the right tyres go a long way towards improving the efficiency of electric vehicles. And thirdly, the more efficient driving style will increase range and reduce the number of charging stops needed. So I can now tick the box that says Guinness World Record Holding Guest for the podcast, which makes me really happy. Many thanks to Kevin for his time. So it's time now for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. What do you get when you mix a bike and a small boat? The answer is an electric kayak. The Old Town Sportsman Big Water EPDL Plus 132, we're just full of phrases that trip off the tongue this episode, aren't we? Works just like a normal kayak, except in this one, you sit upright as though riding a bike and you have power assisted pedals. The pedals drive a propeller which pushes you along. The boat has different settings which will affect both the power it pushes out and the length of time the battery lasts. At full power in level 5, the 36 volt 20 amp power, a 720 watt hour lithium iron battery, lasts for around 3 hours. Dropping down to level 1 will sip away much more slowly at the battery, with the company claiming 46 hours of runtime. All for the bargain price of around 6,000 US dollars. Now, where's my wallet? The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapmap the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps our EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got an electric is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable, is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. 
Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingZV with the words 12 kilowatts at 81%. Hashtag, if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know he's always looking for his latest business venture. Something new, or a new take on something old. But every now and again the answer is really simple. What works for one thing in the field can easily work for a similar thing in a different field. Like his venture dedicated to interpretive dance as a means of educating users about EVs. So basically I thought, well we've done the car thing, so a few of us uh, got together and thought, can we do something in the commercial vehicle space? So thanks for listening. Bye.